Hello and welcome everyone. Um, we have a very exciting topic to discuss today. I'm one of the world's leading experts to bring it to us. But before we get to that, I do have a couple of quick announcements to run through. So um, to start off, we are running Zoom in webinar mode today. Now, let me go over to this slide. Here we go. So what you get from us running Zoom in webinar mode is that you get access to a couple of different controls than you may be used to. Um, you have your usual chat box, that's what you've been using to introduce yourself, but you also have this Q&A box. When you click on the Q&A box, you will have the uh, option to type in a question and submit it for our speaker to answer. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar for about 30 minutes, so we'll try and get to all of your questions then. Um, feel free to submit as many questions as you would like at any point during the webinar. Um, don't worry, it's not going to interrupt the presentation. You also have, next to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, one that says show captions. Uh, feel free to use that to enable or disable Zoom's automatic closed captioning. It can be a little hilarious at times what it makes those technical terms, but it may be helpful for some people. All right, next up, I'd like to give a shout out to our uh, monthly webinar series, which is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. It takes place, um, everything is entirely in Spanish, including the title, which translates to The Science of the Sky for Beginners. Each webinar introduces basic science and astronomy concepts and provides opportunities for casual discussions between presenters and participants. It's totally free and aimed at the general public aged 12 and up. We broadcast these Spanish webinars on the third Saturday of each month, all throughout 2023. So we're having one uh, just next weekend. Please feel free to spread the word about this series to your Spanish speaking friends and colleagues. All right, now back to the webinar at hand. Our 2023 webinars are sponsored by Voice Astro, and we would like to take a moment to thank and acknowledge them for their generous support. The Voice Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and hand the floor over to Walt Cooney. Um, he's the co-leader of the AAVSO Cataclysmic Variable section, and uh, they are the ones who helps to organize today's event, and he has some special announcements to make on the behalf of the CV section. So, Walt, would you like to? Yep. Thank, thanks, Lauren. All, all I wanted to say, first off, uh, my other co-lead, Sean Dvorak, uh, uh, probably won't be able to make it today. He had uh, another commitment come up. Uh, maybe he'll be able to show up late. But I wanted to mention that we will have a CV section meeting, our, our first in quite a while, on Sunday, October 1st, in the same time slot. And uh, I, I hope that works for a lot of people. It, it's never clear when a good time is to try to meet with people all over the world. And uh, everybody's invited. Uh, if you'd like to be part of the CV section, it's very difficult to join. You need to go to the AAVSO forums, to the CV forum, and click join. And now you will get the emails and you have joined the forum. And, and actually anybody interested in CVs is welcome. I'm hoping we will be able to uh, invite some of the professional astronomers who specialize in them to, to be there with us to answer all of our many questions on them. So uh, anyhow, that's Sunday, October the 1st at this time slot. And I'll hand it back to you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, Walt. Um, when you say this time slot, that would be 2 p.m. Eastern time, right? Right, right. Great, thank you. All right, so I think that takes care of our announcements. So now it's the moment you've all been waiting for. Time for me to introduce our very esteemed guest speaker. Um, we are very fortunate to be joined today by Dr. Brad Schaefer, Professor Emeritus of Physics and Astronomy at LSU. Dr. Schaefer is a renowned astronomer who contributes across many areas, including supernova cosmology, novae, recurrent novae, gamma ray bursts, solar system astronomy, and the history of astronomy. He is also a longtime friend and supporter of both the amateur astronomy community and the AAVSO. 
If you attended the last AVSO annual meeting, you certainly remember his enthusiasm for T. corona borealis, which at the time was just beginning to show definite pre-eruption signals. Dr. Schaefer has been studying T. corona borealis intensely for many years and is very probably the singular most qualified person in the world to speak on the subject of T. corbor. And so it is a great honor to welcome Dr. Schaefer to this virtual stage. Dr. Schaefer, please take it away. Well, howdy. Hey, so I'm going to tell you the story of T Core Bohr, and more importantly, what you can do to get frontline science with your telescopes out in your backyard. Okay. Let's begin the story back in the year 1866. Back at that time, there really hadn't been much of any nova that had ever been seen. Well, there were supernova back of Tycho and Kepler, but those are, we now know, completely different. And, and well, in the year 1860, Euscorpi had been seen by a couple people with a couple observations in eruption but no one had ever really seen a good classic nova. That all changed um, uh, on the, the night in May when T. Corbor suddenly appeared as a really bright star right next to the northern crown, Corona Borealis. Um, it immediately led to <laughs> the usual disputes, in this case, long running as to who actually was the discoverer of it, and uh, the, the, the end was really that there were actually three independent discoverers, Walter, Birmingham, and Schmidt. And uh, Schmidt was one of the all-time greatest visual observers ever. And um, he, he was up there with Leslie Peltier and, um, and uh, uh, others. So um, what he did was one night he went out and he was actually looking at the sky in detail for other projects and he noticed that there wasn't anything near Corona Borealis. A couple hours later, he saw it at 2.0 mag. And there you go. So he, uh, he wasn't, I think, officially the first by about an hour, but we know that there was a very rapid rise um, in that final hour there. And so it teaches us a couple things. It teaches us that T Corbor gets up to magnitude 2.0 and that it has a very fast rise. And we're going to have to uh, work with that in, in, in the upcoming year. So we have this eruption in 1866, and you have a large number of observers worldwide actually spotting this. And um, by that time, communication had gotten fairly well. And so you have a huge number of observers observing. T. Corbor in every way possible. Indeed, uh, T. Corbor is the first nova for which we have spectrum of. Well, back at the time, they were just putting a, uh, effectively putting a prism up to a telescope and looking at it visually, but they described all the lines that we now know from, from later eruptions. So T. Corbor was the first well-observed nova and for a long time, it was by far and away the best observed nova, and it became the prototype for nova eruptions. Okay, um, T. Corbor reached a peak of 2.0 magnitudes, and as it, as it decayed away, um, it went, it fell down and, and, and stopped fading, oh, around 10th magnitude or so, okay, um, and it stayed there. And this allowed people to keep watching the thing for, uh, uh, for years and decades. There are a number of observers here who um, um, made observations uh, weekly and monthly for many years in here. Um, at the time, uh, uh, T. Corbor was fluctuating up and down. Uh, well, but people didn't know what to make of it because it was kind of the first nova that people had ever really seen with any good detail. And there was utterly no idea as to what would cause a nova to appear in the sky. So a nova was uh, known only phenomenologically. 
people had no idea what, what might have caused it. You know, a, a typical idea at the time was, oh, you had a meteor storm that, that fell into the star, causing it to brighten. Well, we, we now know that uh, wouldn't work. Um, but that, that's showing you the desperation where they were having of trying to understand what a nova is. No one really had a good idea what a nova was. Well, people kept observing it um, uh, for, for, for a substantial length of time, fair enough. And then in 1920, you had Leslie Peltier, Leslie Peltier himself, starting observing it. And so let me read a little bit to you from his uh, famous book, Starlight Nights. And he has a long section talking about T. Corbor. And the reason he started observing, well, he, he gives the reason why he started observing it. Of all these old nova, T. Corona seemed to me to be the one most likely to quaff the enchanted herbs of renewal. The star was an easy one to observe regularly as it was located far enough north to be visible at some time nearly every clear night. From 1920 on, 1920 on, wow. I watched it closely at every opportunity. For more than 25 years, I looked in on it from night to night as it tossed and turned in fitful slumber. Okay. Um, he, he said uh, elsewhere that what he, he thought that T. Corbor would erupt again, but you know, it was kind of a vague, he had no good reason for it. What happened then in 1945, as he kept watching the thing, he found that T. Corbor suddenly, which it had some usual magnitude it had been at for many years, and, and then it suddenly started fading, fading. It started fading by even up to two magnitudes fading. And Peltier reasoned that this was uh, meant that T. Corbor was going to erupt again. It's actually very insightful, or maybe lucky, but um, what happened is he was sure enough that he went out and put up, he issued an IAU circular. Well, back at the time, it was uh, really a, a Harvard announcement card, but, 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 but he, he, uh, he published a thing saying, hi, T. Corbor is fading, and it's, it means it's going to erupt any day now. And so he kept watching it more and more, uh, more and more frequently. And then other people also started to keep watching it because of Peltier's IAU circular. Picking up this story, then one night in February 1946, it stirred, slowly opened its eyes, then quickly threw aside the draperies of its couch and rose. And where was I, its self-appointed guardian, on that once-in-a-lifetime night when it awoke? I was asleep. Oh, gosh, our, our nightmares. I had set the alarm clock for 2.30 a.m., intending to get up and observe some early morning variables. But he didn't. He went back to sleep. Self-pity comes easy at 2.30 on a cold February morning. So I went back to my warm bed with a comforting thought that I owed it to my family, at least to take care of my health. And thus, I missed the night of nights in the life of T. Cor Bohr. And so the discovery, uh, he, he missed the discovery by a night, okay, and by sleeping. Uh, it turns out the discoverer was a guy in Russia named uh, Kamenchuk, and he actually is not well known. Uh, many secondary sources often attribute the observation to various other people in Europe or, or in the Americas. It was actually Kamenchuk who discovered it first. Um, okay, fair enough. And so <laughs> continuing the story of pathos from, from Peltier. Nevertheless, I still have the feeling that T could have shown me more consideration. We had been friends for many years. On thousands of nights, I had watched over it as it slept. And then it arose in my hour of weakness as I nodded at my post. I still am watching it now, but now with a wary eye. There is no warmth between us anymore. Oh gosh, we 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 all you know, this is kind of a night a living nightmare. Well, anyway, um, okay. So we had an eruption in 1946. It was incredibly well observed, and the idea here is that this one star went up, classic nova eruption in 1866 and also in 1946. 
you know, back at the time, the concept of recurrent nova wasn't really even known. It was T. Corbora that really set this up. Um, and so here you have a recurrent nova. This is a classic nova eruption that happened more than once. In this case, it was separated by 80 years. There's 80 years from 1866 to 1946. And um, so this is the, 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 the prototype recurrent nova. Um, after the discovery of 1946, people observed it in, in great detail and uh, all the way through quiescence and continuing on. And so this is one of the famous stars up in the sky. And I remember back, uh, let's see, I was in, uh, I was 18 years old. I uh, remember hearing of, uh, of Leslie Peltier's story uh, in his Starlight Nights. Um, and I did the calculation that many other people at the time did, the realization of when T Corbor should next erupt. Well, its recurrence time is 80 years. And so you add 80 to 1946, and you come up with the year 2026, which is pretty soon. And so even back when I was 18 years old, the realization was T Corbor is going to go up um, some year around 2026 or so. Okay, there we go. Now, that kind of sets the scene for what we have today. But let me go back and start looking at the photometry. So what I'm about to show you here are just a series of close-ups and, and big views of the photometry. And all of this is in the AAVSO database because the AAVSO is where all the data goes to be used by, well, people like me. Um, so here I'm going to tell you about the photometry results. Okay. Well, let's first off look at the eruption itself. So here is a light curve plot, and this shows, well, basically the first month of the eruption in here. And we see, uh, well, here's the, 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 the point um, where Julius Schmidt, where's my cursor? There's my cursor. Uh, this is the point where Julius Schmidt certainly did not see T Corbor, and these are the observations of Birmingham and Schmidt and so on. Now, we have the light curve in the light green for uh, 1866 and in the dark green for 1946, both in the V-band. And you can see that they're identical. They lie right on top of each other. And this makes a, a moral lesson that recurrent novae always have the same light curve in eruption. And this is actually found for all of the other recurrent novae. Uh, from eruption to eruption in each individual re recurrent nova, they're always the same light curve. So because T Corbor got to 2.0 back in 1866, well, it tells us that the um, that in 1946 um, it was um, the, the the discovery uh, or, or the first magnitude measure just missed going up to 2.0. Okay. Another thing we can get from this is that you have a very fast rise. the The rise time in here is going to be well hours. Another thing you get from this is that T Corbor is a very fast recurrent nova. The light curve has already gone back below naked eye, sixth magnitude, in about a week. So the time it's actually at peak, where it's when it's second magnitude, well, it, it is probably under one day, maybe even a few hours. So you have a very rapid rise, a very short peak, both of which you might measure in hours, and then it's kind of mostly gone, or at least to the naked eye. Uh, within the week. So you don't have very long in here. Okay, fair enough. Let me go and take this particular chart and expand it out in time a little bit from a month to about a year. So here's the light curve we have for the year afterwards. And you can see that uh, this part in here is the same as what, what I have over here. Uh, so I've merely taken this and started showing a lot larger time for the year afterwards. And when you see what happened is T Corbor uh, faded, faded, faded very fast, and it faded down to its pro, um, uh, one of its pre-eruption levels. This is a pre-eruption dip, don't worry about it. Uh, and so it faded back to uh, uh, its pre-eruption level and went flat. So you would think the eruption's over, right? But no, what happened is T Corbor, about 100 days after the eruption, started brightening again it got up to eighth magnitude. And it stayed up at eighth magnitude for about 100 days before going back down to its uh, 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 steady low state level in here. Okay, so what is this? 
there's this second eruption getting up to eighth magnitude uh, done uh, about half a year after the original eruption, no parent connection between the two, but it happened identically in 1946 as in 1866. So, so this is clearly not randomness. This is, there, there's something going on. There, there's something going on to make the timing of this secondary eruption uh, identical between, well, 80 years apart. Okay, let me tell you that this secondary eruption Theorists have, ain't got no idea what's going on with it. I've heard a lot of speculation. I can disprove them all. But something's going on. We have no idea what it is. It's a mystery. And this secondary eruption is completely unique for T core bore. No other nova or anything like it has shown anything like this. So that's what you get from the photometry here. Um, OK, so this shows you the first year. Let me expand this a little bit to show you a few years in advance. This is a light curve from 1941 to 1947. And this light curve here, the one in the middle, is the one is now uh, squinched down into this to the end here. So I'm showing the pre-eruption time from 1941 to 1946. And uh, uh, in this time, the quiescent level was, oh, uh, give or take, call it 10th magnitude. But what happened? is T core bore started to fade, 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 fade. Um, uh, and, and for example, uh, here are some of Leslie Peltier's observations down here. And so this is the time at which Leslie Peltier submitted his uh, Harvard announcement card saying, wow, look how much this is faded. This can only mean that T core bore is going to erupt. And he was right. Okay. Now you might wonder where these blue band light curve uh, magnitudes came from. And these were all taken much after the, the plate was taken. Uh, the, uh, but these are all photographic plates um, that are now stored at Harvard College Observatory. And uh, e e even last year, I can go back and uh, measure and yet remeasure again the plates and get real modern magnitudes uh, from these very old plates. And so also in the B band, you see the same pre-eruption dip going on. With this pre-eruption dip, you, you, you clearly see that it's a precursor to the actual nova eruption itself. So you have a bit of a hint that the eruption is going to be coming, upcoming when you see a pre-eruption dip. OK, now this, this, only show, uh, this light curve over here uh, shows only six years. Let's expand this out now. Wow. And this is actually a fairly awesome light curve. It goes, runs from 1855 to 2023. It's updated to a couple of days ago. And this shows what's going on with T core bore. Well, just to, to recap here, um, in the middle, you have the T core bore eruption, fair enough. And the secondary eruption on this scale, they're, they're both uh, grouped together here. And you can see the pre-eruption dip and then the rise and then the secondary maximum. Okay, fine. And you can also see the same thing going back for the 1866 eruption, although we have no blue pictures, uh, photography didn't, wasn't really working at that time. Fine. So we have a B and a V band light curve. Okay. And let me stop here and point out that with one exception, uh, basically all of this data, all of these 218,000 points all of this was taken by unpaid people working out in their backyard with a small telescope. That's where you get all this from. And so um, AAVSO has been logging the data since, well, 1911. And uh, people uh, after the 1946 eruption, you get a huge number of observations in here. And you also, uh, it, around the year 2000, you start getting uh, AVSO people with um, uh, blue B-band CCD observations with high density of observations in here. So this light curve, this is the foundation. This is what where we're getting most of our knowledge of T-core bore from is from this light curve. And it's all entirely from um, uh, small telescope observations made by unpaid people out in their backyard. Okay, and that's a, a subtle hint, not a, an unsubtle hint that you can do this too. Okay, now um, what you have here is other than the eruptions, 
Most of the time for T core bore, T core bore is trucking along oh, around 10th magnitude, okay? Or similarly, it's trucking along at around 11.5 in the blue band. So most of the time between eruptions is 11.5 in the blue band. But you see, it's especially prominent in the blue band. Um, you see what happens is, well, well, before the 1946 eruption, starting in the year 1935 or maybe 1936, T-core bore started brightening. It started brightening away from this, uh, what we'll call a low state. It rose to, uh, well, what we can call a high state. And it stayed in this high state for uh, getting up on 20 years with the eruption in the middle. So here we have this high state, which is prominent in the blue band. And well, there, there you go. Um, so you also can see the high state in the V band. It's nowhere near as prominent, which is telling you that the high state light is coming from a very hot and energetic source, probably down near the white dwarf. And you can see the same V band high state going away after a decade after the eruption, um, uh, uh, in here, okay, fine. So what we have a picture is T corbora is usually in what I'll call a low state, but for a decade or two decades centered on the time of eruption, um, uh, you have this weird high state. And for what it's worth, there's no published theory as to explain why this high state is there. We have no idea what powers the high state. And I think part of the reason is the, the realization that T core bore had these high states only came when I started getting going out and getting this full up light curve. And you could actually see starkly that there is a high state in here. Okay, fair enough. Um, but it still leaves us with the question of what on earth is going on? This is yet another thing. We have no idea what the cause of the pre-eruption dips. We have no idea what causes secondary eruptions. We also have no idea what is causing the high states both before and or after the eruption. No idea at all. You know, it's got to involve the binary star somehow, but that's not saying anything, okay. So yet another unique and mysterious property of T core bore. Now, when you look at this light curve, it becomes rather blatant that you have T-core bore from oh, about 1955 or so trucking along in the low state, low state, low state, low state. And then in the year 2015, it starts rising again. Holy cow, this looks just like the high state, uh, the, the rise into the high state. And it would imply uh, an eruption roughly 80 years after 1946. So it looks like T-core bore is going into a high state that is a prelude to eruption. Yeah. Okay, let me uh, come back to that point. But for now, let me do a close up of, well, actually, uh, let me do a close up of here. And if you start looking at the light curve in quiescence in the low state or, or in the high state, if you look closely, you can start seeing, well, features. If you look at a close up of this, you start seeing features that are, that are not well resolved on this particular plot. So let's do a close up here from 2006 to 2010. Here's the AVSO light curve again, um, just up and down. By the way, these are visual magnitudes. Uh, so it goes up and down, up and down. It, it looks like it's a sine wave. Um, and actually looking at it in, in detail, uh, it actually is periodic like a sine wave. It's not a perfect sine wave. There are times in here where things are, well, uh, scattered and, and it, it's not a perfect shape for a sine wave. Um, but there you have it, you have a sine wave. You can see the same thing in the blue band, although the sine wave is a lot more ratty. Well, one way to uh, get a better view of what the real underlying shape of this light curve is, is by folding on top of each other many different orbital periods. So here, here's a fold from 1955 to 2015, and you can see that, uh, well, actually, when you average over it, you get a, a, a good uh, not perfect, but you get a pretty good sine wave in here. For example, one of these minimum um, is a little bit late. It looks to be systematically late. That's probably due to effects, uh, for example, with, with the hot spot in the accretion disk, uh, uh, beaming off light asymmetrically. Okay. But you have this up and down, up and down, perfectly periodic. Fine. This tells you a couple things. 
it tells you what the orbital period is because this is ellipsoidal effects. So here you have the ellipsoidal effects. Let me briefly describe what's going on. You have the, the red giant companion star or the companion star, and it's going around a white dwarf in orbit, but the, uh, the tidal pulls makes the shape of the companion star out of round. Uh, we can liken it to a football where the long end is pointing at the white dwarf. And what happens is, is this football goes round and round. Sometimes it's showing broadside on, sometimes it's showing point on and then back to broadside on and so on. And so twice each orbit, you're going to have the narrow side of, T -core, uh, of the companion star pointing at Earth. And the brightness, well, uh, of a narrow side, the brightness of it will be, will be relatively faint. And the brightness when it's shown full side up, um, um, when, when it's shown the, the, the broad side on will be relatively bright. So you have twice each orbit, you'll have a, a maximum in brightness and you'll have a minimum in brightness also twice each orbit. The minimum in brightness uh, corresponds to the time of conjunction. So we have the orbital period has to be twice the, 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 the peak to peak time of this sine wave. It turns out that means the orbital period is 227 days. Now, for people like me, this is a, a, a jaw dropping, holy cow, how can this be? I'll tell you why. Because almost every nova that we've ever looked at has orbital periods of, oh, like three hours, six hours, eight hours. Oh, there are a couple that are up around a one day orbital period, but, but there aren't many of them. And here you have a 227 day orbital period. Well, this is not unique. There are a couple other known uh, 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 novi that have such long orbital periods. But T Corbor is by far and away the best observed of them all. And it's certainly the prototype uh, showing you that something weird, in this case, not unique, but uh, rare is going on with T Corbor. Now, to get an orbital period this long, to have the, the companion star be large enough so that, it, it, well, the, or, the long orbital period means you have to have a very wide orbital period. And so the only way that the companion star can be large enough such that it can start spilling matter over onto the white dwarf is if you have a very large companion star. In fact, it has to be a red giant companion star. And after this conclusion had been known, um, uh, spec people with spectroscopy can go have gone back and confirm this by taking spectrum. And off in the red, you can see a classic spectrum of a red giant star. And in fact, uh, from, th from this, you can also get the radial velocities of it. And so spectroscopy has gone off and confirmed the orbital period. So this is the basic picture of what we have here for T Corbor. It's, it's a red giant star filling its Roche lobe spilling matter over onto a white dwarf, and the spilled matter goes into an accretion disk where it sooner or later will accumulate onto the surface of the white dwarf. And when it accumulates, uh, it, the, when the accumulation is piled high enough, and deep enough, then um, the temperature at the bottom, at the base of the layer, uh, the accreted layer becomes hot enough that it thermonuclearly ignites. What ha what's going on is the nova eruption is just simply, uh, it's an H-bomb, what the heck? It, it, it's a thermonuclear reaction. It's an H-bomb that blows up on an incredibly large scale. And it's this blowing up, which uh, sends out the ejecta, makes the system very bright and what we see it as a nova. Okay, so we actually now have an understanding of what T Corbor is, fair enough. And, but here, here's, a, here's a point that, um, the, the, that I have uh, uh, worked on. Um, I can go back and track the orbital period of T Corbor. I can track the position of the companion star as it goes round and round. Every time it goes through a minimum, that's when you have a conjunction. And so the orbital period will be from uh, one minimum to, uh, well, the next one after, okay? So you can determine a time, you know, a calendar date, a Julian day for when the conjunction happens. And you can backtrack this using my light curve. You can backtrack it all the way back to 1867. So I can tell you the times of conjunction orbit by orbit by orbit from 1867 
up until modern times, okay? So I can track the orbital period going back to 1867. Now, this can all be put together in what we call an O minus C diagram. An O minus C diagram basically tells you how the, the deviations of the times of conjunction would be compared to, well, that which you would have if the period were some constant. So a constant, unchanging orbital period would appear as a straight line on here, on, on, on an O minus C diagram. But you see, especially after 1946, that the data is completely inconsistent with any sort of a straight line. It more looks like, well, uh, uh, putting the point to it, it looks like a parabola. And a parabola in a curve like this implies that the orbital period is steadily changing. So year to year, the orbital period changes by the same amount from year to year to year. And you have this, orb uh, so we have a measure of this orbital period change from the 1946 eruption till, well, um, uh, recently. And, you know, you, you, you can measure it from this and you, you get a numerical value. And that value is humongous. It's about uh, 10 to the five orders of magnitude more than standard theory would predict. Well, it's just telling you that standard theory is completely wrong, but also tells you that we've got no understanding of what's going on in here. How can T core bohr be changing its orbital period five orders of magnitude larger than expected? Uh, I, I have no good answer, by the way. Um, I, I don't know. This is a problem. This is a big problem for theorists. They need to solve this. And well, there we go. There's another problem for theorists here, and that is that you can look at what happened to the orbital period across the 1946 eruption. Now, we, we know of a variety of ways at which the orbital period must change due to a nova eruption, the nova eruption itself. Okay, fair enough. And here we have a measure of it. The measure of the orbital period change is, well, how much of a kink there is at the time of the nova eruption. And there is a positive kink in here that's high, uh, highly significant. And so we have a measure, the orbital period change across the 1946 eruption. In this case, the kink is upwards, which means that the orbital period got longer, okay? Which means, which requires that the, uh, the orbit got a little bit wider by a given amount, okay, fair enough. And we got another trouble here. This orbital period change is also greatly larger than any known mechanism can give us. So th this clearly is not an impossible to understand with theory, but it is impossible to understand by standard theory. And this is telling us that we have to add something, I don't know what, to standard theory in order to explain what's going on with T core bohr. So we have a couple things going on here. And the, the question of these period changes actually start leading into high science. I'll get into a, a little bit more later because these period changes are what drives the evolution. And it's the evolution of T core bohr which might or might not turn it into a type 1a supernova. So T core bohr has long been idealized by many groups within warring camps as being a progenitor of type 1a supernovae. And all of this is coming down to things like uh, the orbital period changing here. So we need to keep getting measures here uh, after the upcoming eruption, see what's going to happen. Is it going to go down? Is it going to kink up? Is, it, is the parabola going to change like it did from then to then? Uh, well, I don't know. We're going to need continuing observations. And that's just simply the, the, um, the, the, the visual light curve. There we go. So the visual light curve has got to keep up going for a long time. Okay, here's another thing. Uh, uh, coming back to a point I made earlier, um, in the year 2015, we saw, uh, for example, most clearly in the blue band, in the year 2015, we saw a rise from the uh, uh, low, low state to a high state. And this is exactly what happened 
in back in 19, well, the 1940s, okay? And so here I have just simply the light curve of a, the AVSO light curve for B and V uh, for a recent, uh, uh, back to 2005. And I've overplotted on it the, uh, a template from the light curve for the 1946 eruption. And so here you see the, in purple, the, the old low state, the rise to the high state, uh, the pre-eruption dip. Again, this is where Leslie Peltier said, hey, wait a minute, something's going on. There should be an eruption. Then you have the 1946 eruption, the secondary eruption, and the high state that follows the eruption before it starts fading away, going back down to the low state. Okay, so what you can do is you can take this template, what happened in 1946, and you can slide it back and forth until you get the best match possible, which is going to be driven by when this rise happens. And then once you've done that, you can just read off the time of the eruption. <laughs> and it turns out the, the, the best estimate for the time of the eruption based on this is going to be 2025, the middle of 2025 with an uncertainty of a bit more than a year. Um, Got to keep in mind here that this prediction is based on the assumption that the eruption in 2025 or whenever um, is uh, T Corbor is going to be behaving the same as it did back in the 1940s. Now, there, there, there's reasonable evidence for this because the eruption light curve is identical between the two eruptions. The post, uh, the, the secondary eruption is identical. The uh, the 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 pre uh, the, the post eruption rise uh, everything's identical. Uh, well, the um, the post eruption rise you have from the uh, uh, 1866 eruption that's identical to the post eruption rise from the 1946 eruption. So everything in here is identical between eruptions, and so it's plausible to think that the timing of the eruption of the upcoming eruption can be given by uh, by observing when the rise is in, in the blue band, for example, and, and just making this simple calculation. But here you see the first gap in it. The 1946 pre-eruption rise um, was brighter by about half a magnitude than we have currently. And so it makes you think that the, the, this the, the, the T Corbor isn't behaving exactly as it is. And one could imagine easily that um, uh, the, the, this recent pre eruption rise is fainter than back in, 19, in the 1940s because the accretion rate is lower and that might delay the eruption by a little bit. So you have uncertainties going on in here that uh, we don't have a good handle on. Okay, so. Um, the, 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 it's just quantifying kind of what everyone knows that, that, that T Corbor is going to go erupting, oh, a year or two from now, something like this. But one thing you have here, you can get more information if you can go catching the pre eruption dip. So, uh, round about this time, a lot of people were anticipating that, uh, by the way, this is the start of, the, of this year. Uh, uh, around about this time, people were anticipating the start of the pre eruption dip. So here it is. We've actually found the pre-eruption dip. And again, it's done with AAVSO data. Here's the AAVSO data from 2021 to a few days ago. And you see the, the V-band light curve and the B-band light curve. Um, and what you have is you have in the V-band light curve, you have the usual ups and downs. This is ordinary uh, uh, ellipsoidal modulation, a little bit ratty here at times, but uh, that's traditional for it. And it keeps on going and going. But you start seeing that, oh, around about March or something like that, it starts going down below what you'd expect. And so for a time in here, it wasn't quite faint enough that you'd be willing to call it. This almost could have been within the realm of normal, uh, 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 normal variations for T Corbor. But largely, uh, around about June or so, things started getting sufficiently faint there was no way that this could have been uh, any ordinary T Corbor variation. And this is seen especially in the B band. So here you have, uh, well, 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 currently in the B band, uh, well, let's see, 1175, um, uh, T Corbor is almost three quarters of a magnitude faint. It's going into the pre eruption dip. Here it is. And the pre eruption dip started, well, some, sometime in here, depends on when you want to call it. Okay, 
Now, we know from 1946 that the visible start of the pre-eruption dip is close to 1.0 years um, before the eruption. Okay, if T core bore is going to behave similarly in its upcoming pre-eruption dip and eruption, as it did back in 1945 and 1946, then we can take the date of the start of the pre-eruption dip for sure, and we can add one year and we can come up with an improved prediction. This improved prediction uses um, the, uh, the, the, the time of the start of the pre-eruption dip. And the date turns out to be, well, 2024.4. That's gonna be, you know, May of next year. Well, how many months away is May? Is that eight months away, something like that? So in eight months, give or take, T-Corbor is gonna go up. Now, the uncertainty on this, well, uh, formally I've given a point plus or minus 0.3. You know, it, it's, uh, it, could, it could occur any time in 2024, and, and I, I wouldn't, wouldn't be unhappy with it. But you know, there is enough variation going on in the system here that I wouldn't be horrified if T Corbor went up tonight. It could do it. T Corbor is variable on all time scales, and yeah, it could go up tonight. Well, I, I expect uh, based on its uh, previous behavior back around 1946, I expect that it's going to go up, oh, give or take eight months from now, give or take uh, a number of months. Okay. But now we actually have a real, um, a, a, a real prediction that's getting fairly tight in here. And so all of a sudden with this one, the writing's on the wall, T-Corbor is going to go up and we know roughly when. And so now is the time that with this notice, uh, there are a lot of professionals out there uh, putting in targets of opportunity proposals like for HST and JWST. And, and many, basically every platform um, is having its targets of opportunity proposals being made for this. We know it's gonna be the biggest event of, 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 of the field for a long time, well, probably since 87A. Um, okay, so, there we go. This is actually important to be able to, well, get some anticipation of when the eruption might happen. You know, it's even valuable for the neutrino people. Where did this come from? T Corbor is the best hope you have, and it's a reasonable hope for being able to catch neutrinos from the nuclear reactions at the initial um, um, uh, hydrogen bomb, which blows up the nova. And the neutrinos should all come over a fairly small time interval so they can improve their um, detection threshold by specializing by looking for T core bore at the time. So there's a lot of utility in going off and getting the 2020, uh, in coming up with a prediction for the date. There we go. So we have eruptions back in the, well, we have the eruptions in the year 2024 or so. We have an eruption in 1946. We have an eruption in 1866. It looks like T Corbor has a fairly regular recurrent cycle of close to 80 years or so. So you got to start asking yourself the question, well, T Corbor probably went off back in uh, 80 years before 1866. I'll put you around 1786. So I've gone back looking for eruptions around the year 1786. And I found a long lost record. It appears in a star catalog. That's actually a compilation of a star catalog made by Francis Wollaston. It got published in 1789, but the book went to press in 1788. And it shows a star. Just a one entry in here without too much comment. This is, uh, it turns out, doesn't matter much. Um, the position, we know uh, from Will Aston's letters that Will Aston measured the position of this star four times or maybe more. He measured it four times with both a large and a small telescope, and he was doing an astrometric position in each of those four times. Okay, so we have a good astrometric position for this particular measure. And it turns out that the position of this is right on top of T Corbor. And there ain't no other stars nowhere nearby. 
near star that he could possibly have, have registered um, is uh, getting near half a degree away. And he didn't make error, astrometric errors like this. This star can only be T core Bohr. And Wollaston's limit was uh, 7.8 magnitudes for his astrometry. And so T, here we have an eyewitness observation of T core Bohr um, brighter than 7.8. And that means it was in eruption in the year. Okay. We know from Wollaston's letters that the observation was uh, uh, made some few days before December 28th, 1787. So here we have an eyewitness account by a very reputable astronomer that it was uh, doing astrometry that T. Corbor went up in December 1787. There we go. Okay, so we have this eruption. You got to start asking, well, what about 80 years before 1787? Well, okay, I haven't been able to find anything from there. And you keep going back in time. Well, I found another long lost report. It appeared, it was written by the abbot, the abbot of a monastery near Augsburg. His name was Burchard. And he was probably one of the most learned men in the country at the time. And he wrote about events. He wrote about it in 1225, and he wrote about the event that happened in 1217. Uh, so it was a moderately recent memory. And this is all placed into a usual monastic chronicle, which told uh, year by year what happened in the year. And for the year 1217, he tells us that he saw uh, a wonderful sign was seen in a certain star in the West. The star was located in uh, Corona Borealis, and the star was originally faint. It shone to a great light and then returned to its original faintness. And the return had to have been over um, a, a little less than a month given the position in the sky. So what we have, well, for him to have discovered this and recorded it, it has to be a, a transient that got to first or second magnitude or, or brighter. And we, so we have a bright transient in Corona Borealis that got up to first or second magnitude. And there are a few things in the sky that can do this. So we can make an exhaustive list of them. It can't be a comet, it can't be an asteroid, or it can't be a planet, it can't be an asteroid. It can't be a supernova because there are no big bright supernova remnants that were off in that sky. It can't be a nova for the similar reasons, um, or a nova other than T core Bohr for similar reasons. So the only idea is, uh, the only possible alternative to this report being of T core Bohr is that it might have been a comet. Okay. But this can't be because uh, Burchard explicitly comes out and uses the word Stella. And that is the, uh, uh, the terminology from the time for a point source. It's stellar. It's a star. It's not a comet. doesn't show a tail. Uh, comets have a separate, completely distinct terminology. And uh, uh, Burchard did not use those terms. He did not see it as a comet. Okay, there we go. There's actually kind of a weird other reason why we know this cannot be a comet. And that is because he calls it a wonderful sign, mirabile. And that's a word that Bouchard uses in his chronicle only when talking about biblical signs, very positive signs. Whereas, uh, whereas comets are universally, the world over, over all ages, comets are always seen as an incredible, one of the worst omens you can possibly get is the appearance of a comet. In fact, uh, Burchard, a little bit later, talking about uh, uh, other comets, uh, 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 connects those comets with appearances of, of famines, death of the emperor, and things like that, uh, uh, mass robberies. Comets are bad things. This transient is a wonderful, a mirabile sign in the sky. Burchard would never have used these words if that were a comet. So it's not a comet, and it can't be anything else. The only thing it could be is T. Corbor. So here we have an eyewitness account of an eruption around October of the year 1217 AD. Wow, who would have thought? Kind of fun, there we go. Okay, so we have T. Corbor is an eruption coming soon to you. When it goes off, it's gonna be the brightest nova 
in all of our lifetimes. In fact, even for people now, before this upcoming eruption, T Corbora is going to be the brightest uh, uh, nova event in anyone's living memory, or uh, or, or that is, uh, I don't know if there's anyone having a living memory of T Corbora going up and being at peak in the year 1946, but at least in principle, it's possible. But T Corbora is going to be the brightest nova in all memory, and when it goes up again, it's still going to be there. You go. Okay, so. There are a variety of mysteries going on that will hopefully be solved when we observe T4 bore going up. We have the wacko unique things that are com still complete mysteries of what is the nature of the high state? What is the nature of the pre-eruption dip? And what, is, what on earth is going on with this second eruption? Hopefully we'll be able to solve that with upcoming observations through the following eruption, okay? But there's a higher issue that I only alluded to already. And that's the question of whether T Corbor is going to become a type 1A supernova. Type 1A supernova are the ones that you use to get cosmology. Type 1A supernova are the ones that spew out metals into the universe. Type 1A supernova are the ones that, uh, that, that, that um, control the um, the, the star formation rates and, and the, the, the state of the interstellar medium and things like that. Type 1a supernovae are important, very important. Um, the cosmology of them, uh, th this is what they give Nobel prizes for, literally for coming out and using type 1a supernovae. And since, well, actually since the 1970s, there's been a long running debate that gets kind of, well, it's not hostile, but well, not hostile, but there you go. You have lines being drawn and people in camps as for what the nature of the type 1a supernova is, or what the nature, what, what is the progenitor of the type 1a supernova? And a lot of questions depend on what the nature of this progenitor is. Um, so a progenitor could be a white dwarf, white dwarf binary that in spirals, or it could be, well, a star like T Corbor. Because after all, think about it, T Corbor, you have a white dwarf that has to be already up near the Chandrasekhar mass, and you're piling mass on top of it at a ferocious rate. And so in, at first sight, the white dwarf should go grow up to the Chandrasekhar mass and become a type 1a supernova, there you go. Okay, fine. Um, there are troubles with that, so it's not a gimme. But you have a lot of people out there who hold up T core bore as being the prototype for uh, the, uh, the, the, the dominant progenitor classes of type 1a supernovae. Um, I personally know why that can't be, but still there are a lot of people out there that do not agree with me on this yet. Fair enough. But we have the question of, well, what can we learn from T core bore in the upcoming eruption as to whether it's going to become a type 1a supernova? And there are a variety of questions that we can answer from this upcoming eruption. One of them is how much mass is ejected by the eruption. That is, if the nova ejects more mass than is accreted during a single eruption cycle, then, um, then the white dwarf mass is actually shrinking and, will, and, and T Corbor will not become a type 1a supernova. Okay. It turns out this how much mass is ejected by the eruption is actually a very hard problem. And the professionals have not solved it. Um, the, the various methods you, you see published are, are all with orders of magnitude uncertainty, even though those huge uncertainties are not acknowledged in the papers. And so expect to see press releases coming up about this when, when somebody makes a measurement, uh, ignoring the fact that their uncertainty is greatly larger than um, they would hope for. Amateurs can't do much on that particular question. But here's another one related to the evolution, which goes into the type 1a supernova question. How is the period going to change across the upcoming eruption? And how is the subsequent period change after the eruption going to be happening? These all tie into the evolution and go into the question of whether T Corbor can possibly become a type 1a supernova. For these period changes, it really all comes down to um, amateurs in their backyard visually watching the, 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 the ellipsoidal changes. So this is something you can take part in here. Then we also have the question of whether T Corbor is, is a neon nova. T Corbor 
Well, what, what is a neon nova? A neon nova is one, uh, maybe 20% of nova are neon nova. And that 20% has the ejecta blown off, which is going to be um, have huge abundance of the element neon. It's like a neon sign out there. I like how. Um, one of the neon nova even has the majority of the ejecta being the element neon. Where'd that come from? There, there, there's basically only one place in the universe where you can get neon with any concentration like that. And it happens if you have the white dwarf being what is called an oxygen neon white dwarf. So you have the composition of an oxygen neon white dwarf being with large parts neon in it. And so the idea would be that if, uh, a neon nova is you have the matter on the surface accumulating, it blows up, and during the eruption, it dredges up underlying neon material, which goes into the ejecta, which is then seen in the expanding nova shell. Okay. So the only way to get a neon nova is if you have an oxygen neon white dwarf. You see, but a neon, uh, an oxygen neon white dwarf cannot come out and make a type 1a supernova. It cannot. We know that. Uh, the, the, the physics of it easily tells us that. So if T Corbor is a neon nova, then it is not a type 1a supernova. Okay, that, that would solve it right there. Well, how do you test with see whether T Corbor is a neon nova? Well, you, uh, for right now, you can go looking back in the past, um, and people have spectroscopy from the uh, 1946 eruption, but finding, a neon, uh, finding the, the appropriate neon lines in there is hard. You have to look far, uh, relatively far in the ultraviolet, and you have to look um, late in the tail of the eruption. I've only found one paper which actually has spectra measurements which fit the bill, and there they show neon lines bright and shining. On the face of it, this makes it look like T Corbor is a neon nova. But for now, this is not a confident conclusion because those old observations were not flux calibrated and people have not gone through and done a full up abundance calculation. It's actually a hard game to play. So for right now, we have the open question of whether T Corbor is going to be a type 1a supernova because whether or not it's a neon nova. Okay. So it's kind of setting the scene for you. Uh, T Corbor is going to erupt soon. And these are the questions that, that are the big mysteries that, well, we can solve upcoming. So let me itemize observations that you can make that are going to address these big time questions. <laughs> you can do it with your small telescope out in your backyard. Okay, first and foremost, the bedrock of T Corbor knowledge is we need a visual light curve. And we gotta have to have this continuing on and ongoing. This light curve is going to go giving you, uh, for example, from now on, it's going to show you the pre-eruption dip in here. And after the eruption, it's going to show you the high state. And it's going to show you um, uh, what, what the long-term quiescent light curve is so that you can go off and measure ellipsoidal variations. For this task of, of, of these three top science issues, it turns out the visual observer, just with an eyeball and an eyepiece, is best. It's better than CCD observations. You ask why? Well, visual observations have a one sigma uncertainty of, of order uh, two tenths of a, of a magnitude. CCD observations might have, well, if, if you work hard, you can get observations with an accuracy of one hundredth of a magnitude. But you see, it turns out that when, you when you're looking for variations that are substantially larger than a hundredth of a magnitude or, or, or a tenth of a magnitude, uh, it really doesn't matter what the accuracy of the observation is. So for example, if you compare the utility of a single visual observation with two tenths of a magnitude accuracy with a single CCD observation uh, with uh, say a hundredth of a magnitude accuracy with say a, a hypothetical Hubble Space Telescope image which gets you one millionth magnitude accuracy. What is the relative utility of those three observations? Well, they're all basically the same because the variations we're looking for are larger than the uncertainty we have for the visual magnitudes. The visual magnitudes are, are perfect for science tasks where you're looking for relatively large variations in brightness. 
So you don't need the CCD observations. The visual tasks are, uh, the visual obser observers are doing just as good for many of these science questions. But you see, the visual observers have a big advantage, which actually makes the visual light curve better than the CCD or any HST observations. The reason is because you can get through AVSO and the myriad of observers, the visual observations over any given week or something like that, you get a huge number of observations. You see what's going on is T Corbor flickers on all time scales. It changes up and down by two tenths of the magnitude without thinking. And so if you get one observation, you're just gonna get on top of random noise and the, the, the high accuracy is meaningless. So the way you win here is by getting many observations. If you have one HST observation, you'll know its magnitude very well at one time, but that doesn't tell you much. Whereas if you take a uh, hundred observations, uh, visual observations over that same one week period, you average over all the flickers up and down and you get a good, reliable, well, long-term average. And that's what you want for the science in hand. So the visual observations are actually better than the CCD observations. And we need people, a lot of people, uh, nightly monitoring t core bore. And this is what provides the fundamental base for the measure, uh, for, for all the science that comes. Okay. Let me give another observing task that really uh, only could or should or, or uh, should be done by the visual observer, again, with an, IP, with an eye to an eyepiece at the back of a telescope. That is going out and looking for the eruption. Okay, the discovering the eruption has big payback to it. The reason is the rise is so fast, the peak is so short that many professional observations and, 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 and observatories are going to be slewed as soon as the eruption goes up and um, they need notice. Because if you, you, if you get observations a day later, well, they're gonna miss the first day, they're gonna miss the peak. So you, uh, all, you have all these professional uh, programs which are operating on a hair trigger. And they should operate on a hair trigger because t bore is so fast in the way of up and down. And so how do you discover the new eruption? Well, you basically gotta keep checking hourly or something like that. And you're just sitting there waiting maybe for a year, uh, checking it hourly, well, it's no fun. But if you have a lot of observers checking it nightly or, or something like that, you're going to catch people, uh, somebody's going to go catching it, catching it in the first hour of its eruption. <coughs> now, there's a, a, a problem here, and that is the, the hair trigger nature of reporting that you have a real eruption in progress. That is, um, it's easy to have a false alarm for any of many reasons we're all aware, well, we're well aware of. So you have to spot t core bore getting brighter than something like 8.5 magnitude. But you got to be sure, because if you go off and you make a, uh, make a false alarm, there are going to be a lot of professionals who are going to be spending a lot of time, and a lot of amateurs are going to be spending a lot of time following up on a false alarm. And that only makes it worse when the real alarm comes. So you got to be really sure before you report that t core bore is an eruption. When you're sure, you got to report it instantly and make sure that it gets shouted to the world. Okay, so um, I, I've asked uh, Elizabeth Wagen uh, how, how best to report this. And the best place in the world is to go submitting your magnitude. Uh, this is what Elizabeth says. You should go submitting your magnitude instantly when you're sure, submit it instantly to the AVSO as part of a normal observation. Uh, hey, I observed t core bore. this is the magnitude, uh, and you, you submit the observation, fair enough. Um, the AVSO has things that go through automatically and will flag, it says, oh, wow, well, and they'll start waking people up, okay? Um, so if you, well, actually for your, your, your non-eruption uh, non observations, you should be reporting them uh, as time goes on too, uh, uh, probably as fast as you can because your, your um, uh, negative uh, eruption magnitude might provide the, the immediate return that someone else's report as a false alarm. So 
when you're sure, instantly submit your magnitude normally to AAVSO at the usual AAVSO website. Then Elizabeth also recommends that you go off and you place a report into, well, the, 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 the web page she specially created, the TCOR board, time-sensitive alerts forum thread with the, the website there, or you can find the links on the web page, and place in there what you see. And when that happens, people around the world are going to see it quickly, spread it to other forums, and the world will be noticed, notified very fast in this case. People get woken up and, and uh, all of a sudden people are going to start invoking their targets of opportunity. HST and SWIFT are going to start getting rescheduled and swing around. SWIFT will swing over probably on the time scale of uh, within the hour after your report, which is good. So the second task for visual observers with the eye at the eyepiece is just keep monitoring t -core bore report your negative reports of it, it's still at magnitude 10 or whatever, and make sure if you spot an interruption, make very sure and report it instantly. There you go. Okay. Here's another task that should be done, and that is um, CCD observations. CCDs are pretty good for some science tasks. One science task that CCDs are wonderful for is getting colors of the uh, uh, colors of the the, the uh, 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 T core bore, both in quiescence and in eruption. And for this, uh, well, actually, as I said, the V the visual light curve is much better than the V band light curve. But nevertheless, in with CCDs, you can you can catch well many AVSO people have already been following this in the B band and the the R band and the I band, um, and that is good science. I should mention that you should not run filterless. You have to run with a standard band, a standard filter, and that means well U B V R I or J H K if you can. You have to run. Uh, with a fully standardized magnitude system. Otherwise, it's useless for this purpose. But here's one most people wouldn't have thought of, and I'd like to try to recruit as many people as possible to do this, and that is the U-band. The U-band records a couple things that, well, the professionals aren't doing this. The professionals aren't doing U-band photometry um, because it's hard in part. Um, but the U-band photometry tells you what's going on with the dust extinction. Um, and it also tells you what's going on with the 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 the, um, the, the very hot light, which is dominating the um, which is dominating the high states. So I would love to see AAVSO or anyone in the world with their small telescope doing U-band CCD photometry on on T core bore, and you might do this weekly or or or, or even daily if you can, um, but. We haven't had that in the past. The professionals have not been doing it. And there's very little data on this in the U-band, in the AVSO database. So if you can do this, start doing it and start doing it now. Let me tell you to be careful on this. Um, U-band photometry is hard. It's hard to do well. Let me tell you the, a primary trick. It's just ordinary CCD photometry but you must use the APAS stars with their calibration in the U-band and the comparison stars you used must have similar colors to you uh, uh, to T-core bore. It, as long as you get that trick, you should have good U-band CCD photometry. And you'll apparently be doing something that the pros aren't doing and, and actually not even many amateurs are doing. Okay, fine. Let me mention one last thing, and that's the spectroscopy, uh, where you can go testing to see whether T-core bore is a neon nova. Again, this feeds into some of the biggest uh, uh, science you can think of here, fair enough. But this is also a, a game not for the faint-hearted. You have to have a good experience of this. You have to have a spectrometer, which goes down to about 3,600 angstroms, because you have to cover the neon lines around 38 and 3,900 angstroms. You have to cover them well, and uh, uh, resolution doesn't matter much. You can have pretty poor uh, spectral resolution and still measure this well because those lines are isolated. 
but the kicker is you have to have a flux calibrated spectrum. And that takes particular types of observations and you have to do that very correctly and do it well. But if you can flux calibrate a spectrum with any spectral resolution down to 3,600 angstroms, you can do it with a small telescope and you can start playing in the big time of answering the question of uh, answering a, a substantial part of the question of, of uh, the type 1, 1A supernova progenitor clock problem. So let me stop here because what we have is, hey, this is my requests, commands, orders. I'm not sure what you want to make of it. This is your opportunity. So why don't I stop here and we can go to questions. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Schaefer. Fantastic. Okay, so um, we have had a lot of questions come in. Let's go ahead and get started with this one, um, since it's related to this whole reporting observations thing. Um, we had someone ask, uh, should your observation, if you happen to uh, catch an eruption and you're very sure about it, um, should you also be reporting that to CBAT? Sure. Um, yes, Dan Green told me yesterday that yes, that that is a good thing to do. Um, okay. But uh, yes, that that is good. Um, if I were you, I would first report to the AAVSO, like Elizabeth tells us to. Yes, would not want to disobey Elizabeth on that. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Alrighty, so um, next question. We got a couple different people asking about filters. So how about let's go to that next. So um, Brian Skiff had asked, would photometry in bands um, besides B and, B and V be useful? Um, he's looking yes. at you and also far red like the Sloan Z band. Um, I would not use the Sloan Z band because I have no idea what it means. Um, it, it's just you won't have very many observations to compare it to. And a lot of the, the science in here comes from comparing observations. And if there aren't people observing with a with Sloan Z or Sloan Q or Sloan Alpha or Sloan whatever, um, it, it, the observations won't be terribly useful. Um, so you really, uh, for, for, for the CCD observations, you really have to be running in a, um, in a standard band. So, CV observations, uh, I would not trust them because you don't know what the color terms are and the color terms might become the name of the game. So you really have to run in a standard filter. And sorry, Brian, that doesn't include Sloan stuff. Uh, 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 basically everyone just throws away the Sloan filter observations because you can't compare them to anything. There's so few of those observations. However, you raise a question that um, the R and the I is perfectly good. Um, and so uh, including R and I uh, in your observations is, is a good deal. So what you might try doing is UBVRI, the classic UBVRI, uh, you know, once a night or something like that, or once whenever you can. Um, so that would be good. Those would be useful. Those would be used. Um, and if you have the ability, and I don't know how many of us do, if you have the ability, getting J, H, and K Classic JH and K is good out there. For example, you might be able to actually get the um, get the light from the dust, which has to be forming out there. I think uh, we can argue this, uh, which makes the pre-eruption dip. Um, again, they have to be standard filters, um, and you got to calibrate them in all the usual ways. Uh, but JHK uh, photometry would be useful. And there aren't very many people getting it. For example, I don't know of any professionals getting it. And come to think of it, I don't know, I haven't seen any such observations being put into the AAVSO database. So if you can get JHK, JHK really is only going to be useful if you get a long run of it, or you put together many people that together make a long run of it, because you have to be looking for differences. Uh, the trouble with the JH and K is you're going to be dominated by the red giant in the system. Um, and so you have to have a baseline where you can look for changes on top of the red giant. So, so JHK, you really have to keep watching for a long, long time to, to, to make any meaning out of this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and talking about filters, there were, um, two filters. I think this was probably covered in what you said about Sloan, but I want to ask this question anyway. Um, 
Heinz Baron brought up that he has a brand new set of Sloan filters and he's wondering if he needs to go out and get BMV for this or can he use the Sloan G prime and R prime? Are those well, okay? You can, or? Use, you can use Sloan filters, but you don't have anyone to compare your observations with and so they don't okay. become very meaningful. Um, and you can't reliably convert them over to BMV because you have a system with with weird uh, absorb uh, emission lines that come and go when you have all sorts of mm -hmm. components that, that are going to make for horrific color corrections. So you can't correct a Sloan G filter to a B or V or anything like that. And so uh, a Sloan, an observation in Sloan G will never really be looked at because you have nothing to compare it with. I Sorry. See. Thank you. No, that's good info. Okay, yeah, so um, Lauren, Lauren, if I could actually just interject for just a, a moment, um, uh, Brad was just talking about JHK filters, and um, I originally thought that with T core bore that would pretty much be on be beyond the reach of um, the SSP four, which is the only photometer that most amateurs have access to that does J and H photometry. Uh, but just looking at Simbad, this thing sits at about um, uh, five point, almost six magnitude in J and fifth magnitude in H. And so it's probably just at the border of what is doable with the SSP4. And when it goes into eruption and uh, you know it should brighten up quite a lot in the, the near infrared as well. And then um, if there's any dust formation, you should see a fairly dramatic increase in terms of flux out in the near infrared. So um, if anybody has an SSP4 equipped with a fairly large aperture in a dry location, ideally, um, uh, you getting and getting some observations out in J and H just to see if you can detect it is probably well worth giving a shot. That's great to know. Thanks for bringing that up, Brian. Okay, um, so next question, moving on from filters for the moment. Um, we had questions. Oh, where would that one go? Here we go. So this is another question from Brian Skiff. Um, in regard to catching the fast rise, will it be possible to use the every scope project in order to catch this? It seems that the data from that project are well hidden, but halving a two minute cadence would be useful. So do you have any thoughts on that? Um, more power to them. Um, that uh, that would be a good idea. Um, I, To be honest, I think it's gonna be the visual observers. Uh, the, 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 the trouble with that is going to be you, you, you need some reliable automated system. Maybe you can hook it up with the with the everyday or every man scope or whichever it is. Um, I've tried that actually back for the U U Scorpi eruption back in uh, 2010, and I was using the ROTC uh, uh, cameras, which were also I had the ROTC cameras going off and taking observations of U Scorpi about once every hour. And it was being done around the world with the ROTC telescopes. Um, it turned out that that was, it could possibly have worked, um, uh, uh, but there were a lot of troubles there. Maybe you can get the every man or uh, the, the, the every telescope system working. Um, that'd be wonderful if you could, more power to you. Um, but I still bet you it's gonna be, um, uh, somebody out in their backyard with an eye to an eyepiece uh, that, that'll catch it. But but if, if you can beat that out, great. Or or alternatively, maybe the the, the the this the these automated things can provide a means of providing confirmation. Because we're gonna have that trouble here. We had that same trouble when U Scorpi went up in 2022. Uh, um, there was going there, there was a report from Asia of it going up. And it was a reliable report, it turned out. Um, but there was a couple hours there where we didn't have any confirmation. And you had people, the professionals and observatories all over the world wondering, gee, should we be triggering our, our target of opportunity thing? So the need for fast confirmation is also there. And maybe you could use your automated scope or wherever this is located, uh, you could use this automated scope to provide the confirmation even if you don't get the discovery yourself. But for whether you should do this, well, it's a lot of work. Um, if you can do it, great. Um, um, more power to you. You might be the discoverer and the, the faster the notice, the better. So go for it. Great, thank you. 
Okay, um, next question here. Someone asked about potentially using their unicellular EV scope in order to um, monitor the light curve of T core bore. Do you have any comments on what they should or shouldn't do if that's the kind of equipment they're working with? Um, uh, could, could someone tell me what a unicellular e e e EUV scope is? I, I, I'm not familiar with it. It's yeah, maybe... a... Yeah, um, maybe, maybe I can pop yeah, in uh, on that one, Lauren. Uh, so it's it's a, a four inch robotic telescope that has a tricolor red, green, blue camera uh, that's in the background. Um, and my my personal opinion is it would actually be pretty good for this purpose. It's uh, very similar capabilities to like a DSLR camera, and they've done some pretty good. Um, they've uh, Unistellar has released a couple of papers here recently showing how they've been able to monitor Nova. Uh, so it's it's definitely an instrument that would work. Um, mind you that it does have a fairly bad infrared leak compared to um, other detectors, but it's very similar to what a DSLR sensor would have. Uh, so the data are certainly quite useful in my opinion. Oh yeah, uh, uh, so, so again, the, the, the same thing would hold for this as for uh, Brian Skiff's idea of the every man scope or whatever, whatever the name was. Uh, sure, um, maybe you can get this up and working and you can have, uh, have the scope check hourly for you. Um, you're going to have the trouble here of getting a pipeline so that the data uh, can be checked hourly. Maybe, maybe you can do that. Um, but that this provides yet another way at which one can hopefully uh, catch the eruption very early on. More power to you. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think that um, actually, Brian, what you said about the IR leak ties into our next question that was coming up. This one's from Josh Hampsh, who had asked, um, can you take U-band observations of T Corbor that are of value if your U-band filter has a red leak? I know a lot of them do. Uh, a lot of them do. Um, this is part of why the U-band is so hard. Um, hey, I, I, I was the replacement or the, uh, for the retiring Arlo Landolt at, at, at LSU, uh, but he still hung around forever. Um, and so, we, uh, you know, every lunch we would hear from him about uh, his work and and he was always bemoaning how hard it is to get U-band observations. And a lot of the reason um, uh, is partly simply calibrating comparison stars, but also because of these um, red leaks. Um, so for the red leaks, you probably can get away with it as long as your stars, your comparison stars have similar colors as does t core bohr so measure what the color of t core bohr is, find the comparison stars that have the same color and use them because they'll have the same amount of red leak or maybe, um, there you go, give, give it a try. Um, and um, uh, there you go. So um, sure, uh, even if you have a red leak, um, you can still take U-band observations, um, it will, merely force you to use stars of the same color. Okay. Well, good advice. Thank you. All right. Um, so our next question here, uh, this one came from Scott Harrington, who was very surprised to hear you talking about the potential neutrino signal. He'd like to know about how far away is t core bohr uh, t core bohr I think, is something like 900 parsecs away. And it's kind of largely not quite, but it but it's one of the closest known nova. And it's certainly the only known nova that it's going to go off anytime soon. And there have been people that have gone off and done ob observation or uh, theoretical calculations uh, because we kind of know what's happening in 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 the uh, eruption. They're all all sorts of, well, it's, it's a hydrogen bomb. you you have uh, you have all sorts of reactions uh, in part where you're converting, uh, protons of hydrogen into neutrons, which are then going to um, go into um, uh, larger atoms like helium or, or carbon. And uh, when you have a proton going to a neutron, you, you emit a neutrino. And uh, so uh, you, when you have the thermonuclear runaway that causes the original nova eruption, you're going to have a flash of, of neutrinos. And actually, that's a little bit of an open question. How long does this nuclear burning last? 
but you'll end up uh, in principle, well, kind of like with Supernova 87A, you might end up, end up with something like uh, a couple minute long flash of neutrinos. And people have done calculations and it, uh, it is suggested that um, you can, if you're lucky, uh, see Nova if they're close enough. And T core bore is about the only uh, Nova that's going to be close enough that, well, closest one in a long time. So if you're looking for neutrinos from Nova, uh, T core bore is the name of the game. You, you aren't gonna have any other chances. And so there you go. Very interesting. Thank you. Looking for right? Nova with it? Oh, where'd that come from? Yeah, I didn't see that coming either. Okay. Um, so our next question here, this one comes from Pradip Karmakar, who asks, um, the secondary eruption, which has occurred in the past, you have any idea if that's going to happen this time? Is that routine? Like, tell us about the secondary eruption. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, we have the light curve, which showed that the erupt uh, the secondary eruption, the light curve from it was identical uh, between 1866 and 1946. The light curves were identical. And so I would have every expectation that the, um, that the upcoming eruption will also have well, probably a basically identical secondary eruption. I wouldn't bet the house on it. There are very few things I'd bet the house on. <laughs> and um, so we're gonna have it. And this is the big opportunity to try and work out what's going on with that eruption. One way to do that is going to be, well, we, we have the light curves of it, but getting spectrum of what's going on then, of uh, looking in the infrared for uh, trying to find dust formation that comes from this secondary eruption. Um, those are the sorts of things that you can do with your small telescope out in the backyard to try and understand what on earth is going on with this secondary eruption. Great, thanks. And uh, speaking of spectra, we did have several questions come in on that topic. Um, first, there's one from Hal Heaton who wanted to know, um, are there spectra from the uh, historic light curves during the past eruptions, you know, in the pre-eruption dip, the post-secondary maximum, you know, maybe not during the eruption itself, but the surrounding interesting stuff. If there are those kind of spectra, do you know what kind of changes do they show? Do they correlate with the light curve? What's sure. that like? Um, so it turns out, that uh, from the time of the pre-eruption dip and the pre uh, the pre-eruption high state, we actually do have about uh, let's call it uh, six spectra that have been published in AppJ, for example, uh, which show the spectrum of T core bore both in the pre-eruption dip and in the pre uh, pre-eruption high state. Um, those spectrum are around. What they show is that the emission lines, especially those in the ultraviolet, the emission lines are much, much brighter. And this is in keeping with the, the idea that the high state is caused by some added on energy source, uh, which is incredibly hot. The nature of this added on energy source that is incredibly hot is not known. And we have a hard time pulling that information from the historic spectrum from the 1940s because they weren't flux calibrated. And so it's hard to know what to make of the, uh, how much flux there are in the mission lines. And, and it, it's clear that the thing is very ultraviolet rich. Well, that's one reason why you'd want to get the U-band photometry because that's an integrated way of getting, get, getting the, 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 the hottest light to see what you have here. Um, so yes, we do have spectrum, but they haven't answered the questions mainly because there are very relatively few of them. We don't have a track record uh, because they aren't flux calibrated and you don't quite know what to make of the old ones. But in the upcoming eruption, we will have all that information. That's what you can do. All right, good to know. Speaking of flux calibration, we had a question come in from Bob Buckheim who said, um, some of us are flux calibrating our spectra based on simultaneous B or V band photometry of the target. We think that's giving us flux accuracy of about plus or minus 10%. Is that good enough? And any suggestions, uh, if you have any, on how we can check our flux calibration accuracy ahead of the eruption and get that? Sure. Um, 
uh, uh, calibrating the spectrum with the B and V magnitudes, uh, known B and V magnitudes, is a little bit tricky because uh, T Corbora is flickering at the 10, 20% level. So you said you're doing it simultaneously, fair enough. Um, that might actually solve the flickering trouble. Um, and that will get you probably pretty good flux calibration throughout the B and the V bands. Um, and that's pretty good. But that's not going to necessarily help you with the U band uh, uh, spectral lines, for example, where the neon lines are. Um, for example, uh, uh, just because you know what the, uh, what the efficiency is effectively in the B and in the V band pass doesn't mean you know it down at 3,800 angstroms. And so you also need some way of calibrating your spectrometer in the U band. And you have the further trouble in here that the U band depends, or, 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 or the brightness of things in the U band also depends critically on the local extinction. And that changes hour to hour. So if you look on one night and calibrate correctly the U band observations, um, that's all well and good. But the next night, you might have more ozone overhead, or you might have more uh, aerosol extinctions, or what have you. And the U band, the, the actual light that gets through in the U band, will be different than what, what you calibrated on the previous night. So if you're going to go calibrating for the neon lines down at 3,800 angstroms, you have to do more than just simply calibrate on some simultaneous B and V. You have to have some way of calibrating in the U band. Uh, the traditional way of doing that is to go off and take spectrophotometry on um, uh, known standard stars for which are constant. And so what you do is you take an observation of a, a, of a standard star um, down into the U, and then with an identical setting, a couple minutes later, you take it identically um, of T core bore. And then from there, you can pull out the efficiencies is a function of wavelength and calibrate everything, uh, everything correctly. So you have to do something like that. Um, and for calibrating in down in the U, uh, down in 3,800 angstroms, you have to do more than just simply scale by uh, uh, even a current B and V magnitude. Okay, thank you. Um... So one more question about spectra, and then we're going to move on to some more on theory focus. This Good. one comes from Paola Corelli, who asks, are uh, low resolution spectra, say like down in the low hundreds of resolution, R500 maybe, would those be useful yes. um, like right now during yes. before the eruption? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> what, what, what's going on? Is there, there are a couple different types of sciences that you can do here. Um, one type of science is uh, simply getting the, the spectral energy distribution and going out into the ultraviolet is, is a good deal that you can do spectroscopically. Fine. <laughs> Again, you need calibrated, real, absolute uh, spectrophotometry to do that. Another fundamental task is going to be getting, and boy, some of you guys can do better than professional angular uh, spectral resolution for getting profiles of individual lines. And that, of course, requires incredibly high resolution. And I'm amazed that people can do it without going to the to the McDonald coup de feed, you know. But but you're doing it. It's it's awesome. I, I just don't understand how you guys can do it. Wonderful. But there's another task in there, and that's simply for measuring relative line fluxes. That's what you need for the neon three lines. Uh, for the neon three lines, you have to get the relative line fluxes, and the lines are uh, emission line fluxes. And for that, you don't need resolution, or well, you don't need much resolution. The lines are usually well separated. And so if you have um, a 10 angstrom resolution, great, overkill. So for getting line fluxes, um, you uh, low resolution is perfectly fine. Um, but again, to get line fluxes, you got to go off and do a real careful and correct flux calibration. You got to put it into physical units. That means you have to have it calibrated with confidence enough that you can stare me in the face and say, yep, I got it. All right. <laughs>
thank you. So um, we our next question here comes from Matthias Kolb, who um, referenced a specific paper. It looks like it was posted on archive a couple months ago. Um, and it claims that T. corona borealis is a kind of a dwarf nova in between the nova outbursts. Um, Matthias is asking if you share this opinion. No, I, I don't see any nova outbursts. You can look at the H, uh, you, you, you can look at the uh, AVSO light curve, and I don't see no dwarf nova outbursts. Um, there you go. Um, All right. So it's not. Um, you, I, I would mention that I've actually kind of been wondering over the years, why doesn't T. corbor show dwarf nova outbursts? You have, uh, you know, GK per is another long period one that does. And, and my, my best idea is that uh, T. corbor is too hot. It has a very high accretion rate, which is why it's a recurrent nova. Um, and that very high accretion rate then makes the accretion disk relatively hot, too hot for the dwarf nova instability to occur. But that can be tempered because the, T, the accretion disk in T core bore is huge. And so, well, the, the accretion disk gets cooler and cooler as you get farther and farther away from the white dwarf. So, so maybe there's a region out in there where you can get it cold enough that you can have the dwarf nova instability happen. Uh, I, I don't know, may, maybe you can hook up an explanation like that, but the, the, the real bottom line answer is you look at the AVSO light curve and there ain't no uh, dwarf nova eruptions. It's just not there. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Um, our next question comes from Hal Heaton, who asked, has anyone determined whether any of the mass lost during the eruption is uh, completely lost, unbound from the multi-star system, and uh, or does it get trapped within the system? Um, Hal's wondering if this might be related to the secondary eruption or the period changing. Um, that's a tricky. Uh, 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 th 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 there's an easy and a complicated answer to that. The easy answer is, yeah, all the matter just blows out of there. It's being blown out at uh, you know thousands of kilometers a second. Ain't nothing going to hold it back. Um, it's gone. It's long gone. Um, it's it's not going to be bound. Okay. Now, given that, there are wonders and worries and ponderings and consideration that maybe not all of the matter gets thrown out. And the way the question was phrased makes it sound like he's wondering about what we might call as fallback. Not impossible. I, I don't see how that could possibly be though. Um, you, you can't get much in the way of fallback because the, the, the wind is just going at such high velocities that it's just going to blow everything away. And, and when, when the eruption peters out, you don't have a, a low velocity, uh, certainly not low enough. You know, but there still might be some small fraction of matter that goes out and, and comes back as a, 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 a circumbinary disk. And, um, but actually, we have zero evidence for that happening. But it might not be impossible that some fraction remains far outside the binary and, and uh, disk, and you can wave your hands and speculate. But we have zero evidence that such happens. Gotcha. OK, thank you. All right, um, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, next one, you mentioned that neon novae can't possibly be progenitors for type 1a supernovae. Could you please explain some more about why? Sure. Um, the basic uh, uh, type 1a supernova is, is well known to be a, a you have a you have a white dwarf that gets up near we were discussing detail details are heavily debated but the the, the white dwarf gets up near the Chandrasekhar mass and the the uh, the, the, the equation of state of the matter can't hold it anymore. The star starts collapsing, it rebounds, and that's the, the eruption, okay. For the rebound to happen, you also have to have a, 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 a nuclear reaction wh which liberates a large amount of energy. And that energy that gets liberated uh, comes from uh, the, the, the carbon burning. And it turns out that the other types of elements, neon uh, included, don't uh, can't produce 
that much energy per, per mass of a white dwarf. And so a neon nova that collapses cannot have enough nuclear binding energy that can be released um, to create the energy which would be a type 1a supernova. Um, so if you had a collapse of a oxygen neon magnesium white dwarf, um, well, you would have what was, might be called an accretion-induced collapse, which will be basically the star disappearing with no nova eruption. And there's some middle ground in there, but we would not call those as type 1a supernova. Um, so we know that the neon, no, oxygen neon white dwarfs cannot produce type 1a supernova simply because the neon and the oxygen does not have enough binding energy that can get released by nuclear burning. Let me give you another reason why we know concretely, certainly, that a neon nova or, or, or an oxygen neon white dwarf will not produce a type 1a supernova. To make a neon nova, you have to have the material on the surface of the white dwarf that erupts, that explodes, the, the nuclear bomb. That material has to uh, dredge up material deep down or, or, or moderately deep into the core of the white dwarf. It has to dredge it up. It has to get that material so it can spew it out into space. Okay, so to be a neon nova, you not only have to have the white dwarf blowing off all the mass that it accreted during the previous eruption, but you also have to have it chipping away at the underlying white dwarf and blowing it off too. It's the only way you can get the neon out there into the ejecta. <laughs> but you see, what happens when that happens, you eject not only the matter you accreted during the eruption, but you, uh, you eject even more material on the surface of the white dwarf. So the white dwarf is being whittled down in size. It's becoming less and less massive. So right now for the uh, white dwarf to uh, go nova, well, it might have, a, say, a 1.3 um, solar mass white dwarf. But if it's a neon nova, the next time it erupts, it'll have a little bit less matter, then a little bit less, and a little bit less, and a little bit less. And if you have the white dwarf being whittled down to smaller and smaller mass, it is not, clearly not, going up in mass. It is not approaching the Chandrasekhar limit where you would have the, um, the, the type 1a supernova event. It's going away from the Chandrasekhar limit. So for a second reason, we know certainly that a neon nova cannot become a type 1a supernova. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thanks for that answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so, oh, let's see. I think I just accidentally dismissed the next question in the queue. Um, it was also about neon novae. Oh, yes. So uh, Jay Shears had asked, how far into the eruption uh, might you anticipate seeing the appearance of the neon lines or being sure that they're not appearing? Right. Um, I would call it in the middle tail. Um, and I haven't ever seen it quantified as to when you should go looking. But you have to get past the transition phase. Um, and you don't want to go too late because then things uh, become harder. So, so, so maybe starting a week after the peak of T core bore and continuing for uh, the next month, th that would be the time to look. Okay. And, and it's you. a little ill defined, and I, I, so I don't have a, a sure answer for you. All right. Thanks. So I think we have time for two or three more questions. Um, so here's an interesting one from Tasso Napoleano, who would like to know um, if you could comment on the similarities and differences between T. Corona Borealis and RS Ophiuchi. He notes that both of them have long orbital periods and red giant components, but RS Ophiuchi has been erupting far more frequently. So uh, he's curious about that. Sure. Um, I would call RS Ophiuchi and T core bore as sister recurrent novae. Um, they're pretty similar. I can't think of any particular um, fundamental difference between the two. Um, the recurrence time scales are different between the two. T core bore is close to 80 years. Uh, R, uh, for uh, T core bore is 80 years. The recurrence time scale for RSO 
uh, shows substantial fluctuations um, and is more like uh, 20 years. So that difference in the recurrence time scale is roughly a factor of four. And I think, uh, but, but, but they're white dwarfs are of similar mass. So I think all that means is that RSO happens to have four times higher accretion rate than does T corbore. And uh, most of us would consider that a fundamental but, but incidental difference. Okay, thanks. Okay, our next question here comes from Scott Harrington, who asked, uh, do you know if the Berry Center is closer to the uh, red giant or to the white dwarf? Well, um, the white dwarf in T Corbore is uh, 1.33 solar masses, give or take a couple hundreds. Um, the mass of the uh, uh, of the red giant, well, the latest de uh, determination, uh, which is undoubtedly good, uh, Joanna Mikulajuska is doing it. Um, I think uh, I think her latest answer was about 0.8 solar masses. So the um, you, you have a 0.8 solar mass companion, and you have a 1.4 solar mass uh, white dwarf. So so roughly the, um, the 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 center of mass is going to be well kind of near halfway between, but more to the uh, but more to the side or, or, or the, the balance point. Excuse me. Uh, the, the the balance point is going to be uh, uh, more towards the red giant, um, and given the Roche geometry, that means that um, actually I, I should know this. I, I, I'm, I'm uh, the, the 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 center of mass of the system is going to be close to the surface of of the red giant. I'm not sure. I, I should actually be able to say where where it is, but it's somewhere near close. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, I think this will have to be our last question because we're running out of time. Um, we did have one come in from Sarah Beck, who remarked on how bright T coronavirus is going to be at maximum and asked, won't that make it too bright for uh, like Hubble and James Webb to observe? <laughs> um, partly, yes. Um, and, and actually, Sarah is one who knows an awful lot of those old details of of the, the the history of T core bore, so she's kind of the person I'd gone to for for a variety of information on this. Uh, her, her and Elizabeth. Um, anyway, yeah, it's going to be pretty bright, and that's actually been a going to be a substantial trouble. Uh, for example, I've been working a lot with the Swift people to try and work out how on earth we're going to get get Swift to look at T core bore in the X rays and in the ultraviolet. And it's going to be too bright for Swift in the ultraviolet. And so Paul Kuhn is talking about ways of maybe he can use, he can calibrate off of glints in the field of view. Um, and, and there might be ways of doing it. And well, yes, it is a problem. Uh, there okay. we go. Um, uh, for HST, uh, that will be a problem too but maybe not quite in the way you'd think. Using HST or James Webb when the thing is at, at its brightest is going to be hard. For example, or one, one, one simple reason is because HST doesn't have that fast of a turnaround time. It takes a while to get their incredibly complicated schedule changed for a, a, a sudden target of opportunity. Um, but you probably wouldn't want HST to do the observations at the at or near the peak anyway, because um, you can do it from the ground. And the one exception to that is UV spectroscopy. But even then, SWIFT will be able to do that by the time when it gets to sufficient, uh, sufficiently faint that SWIFT or HST can watch it. So yeah, it's going to be awful bright, but HST probably should look at a uh, at a time relatively late when T Corbore has gotten faint again. So HST and JWST have coronagraphic modes, and so that can go looking for things around the. Um, the, uh, the the inner binary, even at its brightest. So you could do that. You wouldn't be looking at the inner binary, but you'd be looking at the area around it. 
And that's something that might actually be useful. So here's a try. I've realized for a long time that there's a uh, T core bore has launched out an awful lot of matter, both from its red giant wind and from its 80 uh, eruptions or 80 uh, once every 80 years for at least the last millennium. Okay, um, so there's got to be a lot of matter outside and around T core bore. And what's going to happen is you have T core bore is going to go off and it's going to be like a flash bulb going off. And you're, it's going to illuminate the material around you. So you will see a light echo. And the light echo won't be from the, 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 the point disk of, of T core bore. It'll be in the region around it where the light is being bounced off all of this material it previously ejected and delayed for coming back to us. So you would want to look for these light echoes at a time a month, a year later to look for the echoes. In fact, if you keep making a lot of observations, you'll be able to map out the dust distrib or the distribution of material that has been ejected by T core bore. So yesterday, I uh, in, in while talking about other uh, uh, recurrent nova issues, um, I emailed off to uh, one of the people who uh, uh, could, would, and should do something like this and saying, oh, yeah, gee, and I, I'm sure you're going to be putting in app, uh, uh, proposals for HST in particular, maybe JWST, on exactly this of looking for light echoes from T core bore. And uh, just an hour before the, the, the talk started here, I got back an email from him saying, yep, already done. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you so much. That is unfortunately all of the time that we have for questions. We still have a lot of really good questions um, in the queue. To everyone who is still waiting on an answer to your question, I would like to urge you very strongly to attend the Cataclysmic Variable Section meeting. T Corbor is going to be a hot topic there. I feel like I can I can speak for them on this, and um, you should be able to get answers to your questions um, if you if you tune into that meeting. Um, as Walt said at the beginning, the first cataclysmic variable section meeting is going to be held on October first at two p.m. Eastern time, same time of the day as this webinar was. So, yeah, if if you're at all interested in observing T Corbor, don't miss it. <laughs> all right. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Schaefer. This has been an absolutely outstanding talk, and you're really, really good at handling questions as well. I'm just very appreciative towards you. Um, in fact, I want to offer you an official thank you just on behalf of everyone at the AAVSO, because, <laughs> because um, seriously, this was excellent. So thank you. All right. And um, let's see closing announcements. Um, before we close out, I would also like to thank again our sponsor, Boyce Astro. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their website to learn more about their work. And uh, today, I would also like to offer a special thank you to everyone in the audience. Um, you guys came up with some really top-notch questions today. Um, I feel like I learned a lot just from what you asked and prompted Dr. Schaefer to talk about. So uh, it uh, brings up the point that it's your participation in all of our programs that allows us to keep growing and educating and making an impact on variable star science. You guys are the observers who make it happen, and thank you for doing that. We're very grateful for your support. All right. Um, fortunately, today's broadcast has been recorded. So if you would like to go back and review any of the details, um, reference anything, or hey, send it to your friends, you can do that. Um, right now, the recording is on our Facebook page. It's automatically uploaded there like instantly. And um, within the next day or so, we're also going to upload it to our YouTube channel. We have a very large library of educational videos on our YouTube channel. And um, you can find that library by going to YouTube and searching for the username AAVSOHQ. 
Okay, um, when you log out of the webinar today, you should be automatically redirected to a survey it should pop up in your web browser. Um, and I would really appreciate it if you could fill out that survey and just let me know what did you think of today's webinar. Um, what did we do well, what could we maybe do differently in future broadcasts I'd just really like to get that feedback from y'all so thanks. All right, to close out. I would like to express one last huge thank you to Dr. Schaefer from all of us at the AAVSO. This was wonderful and we appreciate you.